pray. Father, thank you so much for your word that brings light to our souls, that takes away our darkness, that takes away the coldness, brings us the warmth of God. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to us this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, John chapter 4, verse 10. Jesus answered, said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest ask of him, he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with. The well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Abraham, than Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith to him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to drink. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou, thou now hast is not thy husband, and that thou saidest truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh and now is when the true, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. And saith unto him, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples, marveled that he talked with the woman. Yet no man said, What seeketh thou? Why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot, went her way into the city, and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city, came unto him, in the meantime, while his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said his disciples one to another, Hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. Say not ye there yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, Lift up your eyes, look on the fields, they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit into life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. Herein is that saying true. One soweth, another reapeth. I sent you to reap, whereon ye bestowed no labor. Other men labored, and ye are entered into their labors. Many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. Many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Quite a, quite a history here, quite a lot of different scenes that are taking place. I mean, we're in a passage in the Bible that, uh, that, that really is bringing out or enlightening or, or, or un, uh, telling us a great mystery in, throughout the scriptures. What's the mystery? The preaching of the gospel to the Gentiles and the receiving of the gospel to the Gentiles. Now, we look in our, in our fellowship here today and we say, so what's the big deal? We're all Gentiles. <laughs> but you got to remember that for thousands of years, not the case. And this was the beginning here, and God revealed himself in history, really, to a select few number of people known as the Jews. Yet God promised 
that the knowledge of God would be spread over all the world like the waters are spread over all the seas in Isaiah 11, 9. Isaiah 11, 9. Isaiah 11, 9, when there were just a select few of the Jews that had the knowledge of God, when God said, the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Habakkuk 2.14, Habakkuk 2.14, the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Yet this was a mystery, how this was to happen, as the Jewish people really kept to themselves and did not carry the knowledge of God over all the earth. One problem was that for the most part, of the, the Jewish people, they rejected the knowledge of God. So they hardly were in a, a state to be able to carry the knowledge of God to all the earth. But here we see in this chapter the beginning of the floodgates opening, the knowledge of God spreading over to the Gentile world. And in this chapter, it all began with the most unlikely representative of the Gentile woman, world, a woman, a Samaritan woman, an adulterous woman loaded down with sins. And yet this Gentile woman represents the condition or represented the condition of the Gentile world, which the, which, which the Bible called was a condition of darkness. In Isaiah 60, verse 2, Isaiah 60, verse 2, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. This woman represented the Gentile world in their state of darkness. Sin had put this woman into a state of darkness. Sin had blinded her and took her very far away from God. And this woman, in her personal state, was, the, was really described in Isaiah 60, verse 2. Isaiah 60, verse 2, as in a state of gross darkness. But one day, at a well, this woman saw God, saw the Lord. And this woman saw the glory of God, just like God said what happened to the Gentile world in Isaiah 60, verse 2. And it all happened when Christ built, in her really a level of anxiety, and, and in her, when he told her in verse 10, in verse 10, he said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou would have asked of him and he would have given thee living water. Christ knew everything about every person. And Christ knew that if this woman knew that Christ was come to the earth in human form as God, come to the earth in human form. As a gift of God, Christ knew that she would plead with Christ to give her living water, and he would give it to her. He's told her that. And in verse 10, when Christ told her those words, if thou knewest, Christ knew for certain what she would do if she knew Christ knew that if this woman knew who Christ was, that, that she would ask Christ for the water of life. This statement that he said, if thou knewest, thou would have asked, this statement was not true of all people. This woman saw Christ perform zero miracles, none. But there were some Jews that saw Christ perform many miracles, and Christ could not say to those Jews that if they knew Christ was the gift of God and who Christ was, that they would have asked Christ for the water of life. But this woman was different, and Christ knew that she was different, and, that, and that's why Christ told her in verse 10 that if she knew who Christ was, that she would ask for living water. There were other times when Christ spoke in essence, about if they knew. And again, he knows everything about everybody, so what he said is true. And, he, and, 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 and the times when he talked about if they knew were the woe unto portions of what Christ said. For example, in Matthew eleven twenty three, Matthew eleven twenty three, 23, he said, 
Thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, that it would have remained until this day. Again, Christ knows everything about everyone. Christ knows everything about Sodom. And when Christ said that if Sodom had seen the same mighty works that Christ did in Capernaum, Christ knew that Sodom would have repented of their sins and Sodom would have been spared. Sodom would not have been destroyed. He wasn't guessing about Sodom. He knew that if Sodom had seen the same miracles that Capernaum had seen, that Sodom would have been saved. He knew that about Sodom. And in verse 10, Christ added that if she would have asked Christ for water, that he would give it to her. And when Christ said that, it's so tragic. It's so tragic for us to think that there are those in hell who knew who Christ was and did not ask Christ for the water of life. And for all eternity, the torment will be the thought, Christ would have given me the water of life if I just would have asked. All I had to do was ask, and I didn't ask. That's an absolute tragedy. Now, after Christ has told her these things, it was not that the woman jumped and believed Christ and then asked him immediately for the living water. That's not what happened. We've got a couple verses in between, which are verses 11 and 12. And in these verses... She is resisting Christ. She's pushing back. She's doubting Christ because she didn't see the living water. She didn't see what Christ was going to use to dry out the living water. And she, wasn't, she didn't think Christ was greater than Jacob who gave the well. Those were all pushback statements that she made to Christ. She was, what, was the, what was the problem at this point? The woman was operating on the basis of physical sight. And the Bible says that the way of faith is not by physical sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 2 Corinthians 5, 7 says, we walk by faith, not by sight. We walk by believing faith, not by physical sight. So when the woman said in verse 12, I don't see what you're talking about. I don't see the living water, and I don't see how you're going to get this living water. The woman was walking by physical sight. The woman was saying, I must see first, and then I will believe. And what the woman did not understand is that the, that the way to see first and then believe is not God's way. That's the way of physical sight. God's way is a way of faith, and the way of faith is the opposite order. It's the opposite of see first and believe, then believe. God's way is believe first and then see. Man's way of sight is see first and believe, and this is what the people said to Christ on the cross in Mark 15, 32, Mark 15, 32 when they said, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. That was their way. See and believe. They were saying that if they saw Christ come down from the cross, then they would believe. That's man's way. See first and believe. It's not God's way. God's way is faith, which is belief first, then you see. And Christ said that, that she needed to follow God's way of faith, believe first, and then see. This is what Christ said also in John eleven forty. John eleven forty, Jesus saith unto her, said I not unto thee that if thou wouldst believe, then thou should see the glory of God. That was all about Lazarus, but that was what he said. 
He said, you believe, then you'll see. So when he said that, in John eleven forty, 40, if thou wouldst believe that thou shalt see, he was saying God's way of faith, in, it, it, it was that order. This is what made Abraham the father of faith. Abraham was almost 100 years old. He had no child. They were infertile, no child. And he could not see how his line was going to be continued. And with Abraham not able to see, God promised Abraham that his seed would be so vast that it would be in number like the number of sand, the grains of sand on the seashore. And it would be in number like the number of the stars in the sky. And Abraham believed God and therefore later in heaven, now Abraham is able to see how vast his seed was. And that was all because of Genesis 15. Genesis 15, when God took him out. Well, first of all, he, he, said, to, he said to God, I don't have any seed. And God said, come outside. And he says, look up in the sky. It was night. He says, you see all the stars? You should, she's going to be like that number. It's like the sand of the sea. And that's God's way of faith. Believe first, you see later. And which is why we devour the Bible because the Bible tells us what to believe. The Bible gives us promises like Psalm 8411, Psalm 8411. God, the Lord, is a sun and a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. That's a promise. Romans 8.28 is a great promise. Romans 8.28 says we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his promise. That's a promise. Job, uh, John 14.2, John 14.2, 14, John 14, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. That's a promise. We believe those promises. We don't see any of those promises. We believe them, but then later we see them. And this is what is so encouraging in this chapter is to see that this woman started off on the wrong road. She started off on the wrong road of see first and then believe. And what's so encouraging about this chapter is that Christ didn't walk away from her. Christ didn't say, but, but he continued to work with her. He continued to instruct her little by little. He continued to straighten her out, to teach her until she finally came to the place, the way of faith, where she believed first, and then she said, I'll see later. And that was a great triumph. It was a victory for this woman in her personal life when she came to believe that Christ had this invisible water of life to give her that, that would forever take her thirst away. And when she believed that Christ would give her that water without her seeing how he would give her that water, she reached a triumph of faith. And that was in verse 15. Verse 15, when she said, sir, give me this water. What she's saying is that, sir, give me this water I can't see. Sir, Draw this water out to me that I don't see how you're going to do it. And he gave her, Christ gave her that invisible water. And when he gave her that living water, which was the person of the Holy Spirit to live inside of her, she had an ever-flowing spring of living water inside of her, which is what Christ promised in John 7, 38. John 7, 38. He that believeth on me... As the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. That woman saw how she was now satisfied from inside of her. She was satisfied, satisfied from inside of her, which is what Proverbs 14.14 14 says. Proverbs 14.14 14. A good man shall be satisfied from himself. That's what it's referring to. 
the gift of the Holy Spirit inside of a person. Now, Christ brings up to the surface something that the woman is ashamed of, something that the woman is embarrassed about. He brings up to this woman her gross sexual sins that she's tried to forget and bury and would just as soon not talk about it because he asked her, call your husband, and she just wants to just get away from that subject as fast as possible. She said, I don't have any husband. I don't have any husband. It reminds me of my grandson, little uh, Josh. He's not little anymore. He was then, little Josh. And I was over at the, their, their house, and they had a washing machine in the garage. And little Josh had taken and thrown rocks inside the washing machine. <laughs> and so... Uh, the rocks were making all the noise and everything. And, and his father said, uh, called him over and says, uh, Josh, I want to talk to you about this. And, and he walked away and says, I don't want to talk about it right now. <laughs> he says, I don't want to talk about it right now. <laughs> this woman, when he said, go call your husband, she said, I don't have any husband. She would say, I don't want to talk about that right now. I don't want to talk about that. <laughs> but... He said, but Christ didn't say, no, we're going to talk about that right now. He said, uh, he says, yeah, you're right. You don't have a husband. You had five. And the woman, the man you're living with right now, you're not even married to him. Now, at that point, the woman might have walked away, seeing that Christ has brought up that she's a dirty, rotten sinner. But the, the, but the great thing is the woman does not walk away from Christ. Instead, the woman honors Christ with a confession in, in verse 19, verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. Now, the woman has said that he's a prophet and because he's got the full knowledge of her and she's saying to herself, this man knows me. He knows everything. Not just me, he knows everything. Now is my chance, she's saying, to ask this prophet of God some questions that have really been bothering me, really been troubling me. He, he, I, I, I perceive, she's saying, I perceive that if I'm wrong, he can correct me. That, that, that if I'm misled, he can guide me into the truth. And I don't have to wonder any more about what's truth because he's going to tell me. And the question that she's wondering about is where on earth is the right place to worship? She wants to worship God and she wants to worship God in the right place and, 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 and in the right way. But she doesn't know where and she doesn't know how. And this was what's bothering her. And, you know, am I supposed to have some beads? How many beads? Am I supposed to say some words? What words? And so forth. She knows what she's been taught by her fathers. That would be the same as saying tradition. By the ancient ones. But she doesn't know if that was correct. So she's got this real sincere heart. That, uh, uh, and she wants to bring Christ these questions. And she's all ears to take in what Christ is going to tell her when, when she says in verse 20, verse 20, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. So what Christ tells her, or what he's going to tell her, is going to not be in line with what she's been taught. It's not going to line up with what she has always believed from a young child is the truth. And so he starts off, he's going to break this, he's going to break this, this wall here. He's going he's to shatter what she's always believed. So, so Christ knows he's going to do that. So in verse 21, he starts off by saying, Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, because I'm going to set up a competition 
between your fathers and your tradition, and they're saying, believe me, and I'm telling you, believe me. He knows this. And then he tells her something that is, for her, shocking, that this really just broke up her whole world of religion. In, in verse 21, verse 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain, which, by the way, was Mount Gerizim, nor yet at Jerusalem, which is Mount Zion, worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship. Salvation is of the Jews. The hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, that's an important word he said, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. She heard that. And that was like a wow. That was a lot. And so this woman is taking it in, as Christ has told her. True worship will not be in Jerusalem at the temple, will not be at this Mount Gerizim, where she's been told is where she must worship. Then she's told that she has no idea who she's worshiping because she's in a religion of darkness. Then she's told that the Jews know who God is because the Jews have the knowledge of God. They have the scriptures. And Christ tells her that she needs salvation, and salvation emerges, is emerging or coming from the Jews. And what Christ meant by that is that salvation is not in actions or acts, Salvation is in a person, and that person is Jewish, and that person is standing in front of her, Jesus Christ, who she already said, thou being a Jew. So when Christ said that salvation was from the Jews, Christ was telling her that Jesus Christ is coming from the Jews. Now next, Jesus Christ tells the woman something that blew a hole through all religious worship in verse 23, he, he, when he used the term true, he said to describe a group of worshipers which were called the true worshipers, which means that there's another group which are the false worshipers. And he explained that the true worshipers, the true worshiper is a person who worships the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, to worship in spirit is opposed to worship in acts or ceremonies or ordinances. To worship in spirit means that there's no emphasis put on where to worship. There's no emphasis put on the, the, the acts, the ceremonies, the ordinances of worship. To worship in spirit means there's an emphasis put on the state of mind of the person who worships. And true worshipers of God lay emphasis on the state of the heart, the state of the mind. True worship is focused on parts that can't be seen, like the living water, and, and by another person, which in the Bible is described as the inward parts or the hidden part in Psalm 51, 6, Psalm 51, 6, where David said, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So the Bible describes a true worshiper as the person who has really worked on his heart, really in, worked to engage his heart to approach God. This is what's stated in Jeremiah 30, verse 21. Jeremiah 30, verse 21, where it says, I will cause him to draw near, he shall approach unto me, for who is this that engaged his heart to approach unto me, saith the Lord. So the difference between the true worshiper and the false worshiper is that the false worshiper believes that he can do righteous things by himself. He can, he can be righteous in himself, and he doesn't need to stir himself up 
to seek God to forgive him for any inward things like sins to be forgiven from and cleansed from. Whereas the true worshiper sees that his personal righteousness, they're filthy rags. And he's working on not trying to do personal righteousnesses, but he's working on stirring himself up to seek God for forgiveness and cleansing from his sins. This is what's brought out in the two verses of Isaiah, Isaiah 64, 6 and 7. They go together. Isaiah 64, 6 and 7. Here's how they say. This is Israel speaking. We are all as an unclean thing. This is, this is Isaiah 64, 6. We are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. And there is, here's the next verse. And there is none that calleth upon thy name that stirreth up himself to take hold of thee. For thou hast hid thy face from us and hast consumed us because of our iniquities. True worshipers are, are calling on the name of God and they're stirring themselves up inside to, 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 to grip God. And Christ described false worshipers as people who concentrate on what comes out of their mouth and have no emphasis on how far their heart is from God. And Christ said that the false worshipers focus on teaching a set of do's and a set of don'ts, like 613 commands. This is what Christ meant in Matthew 15, 8, Matthew 15, 8, when he described the false worshipers as, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. See, this false, this is false worship. It's all about the prayers that you, the words of the prayers that you recite. This false worship was, was dramatically seen last Wednesday in Jerusalem when at the Wailing Wall, 50,000 people Jewish people gathered to pray for the 139 hostages that are held in Gaza. And the emphasis of what they did was they said that they had the chief rabbis there and they said they pulled out a prayer, a Jewish prayer that had not been prayed for 50 years. They like pulled this prayer out. It hadn't been prayed in public for 50 years. And because they said this prayer, and that hadn't been prayed in 50 years, that they expected the gates of heaven to open up and release the hostages. That's false worship. It's in another prayer, which they also prayed, which they normally don't pray on this day, was the Selakot prayer, which is, which is normally recited in Yom Kippur. I'll quote to you from the, the, the Jewish news. Quote, during the gathering, the Selakot prayer was recited according to both the Sephardic and Ashkenazi traditions including chapters from the Yom Kippur Katan prayer. That's false worship. The worship with those prayers being recited by the chief rabbis who were on a balcony, elevated above all the people there at the Wailing Wall. And this is the emphasis on reciting words, being seen by people, is what Christ warned about in Matthew 6, 5. Matthew 6, 5, when he says, when thou prayest, Thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. They love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy father which is in secret and thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. And when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your heavenly Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. A true worshiper, he goes in here. He goes down, he goes in here, and he shuts the door. That's what he does, see? Like that. And he prays, and he comes out, and nobody knows he's been in there. That's what happens. That, that's what he said. The true worshiper hides himself. To pray. He doesn't want anybody, he doesn't want to be seen 
Whereas the false worshiper, he wants to be seen. He wants to be heard when he prays. It reminds me of a reporter who attended a, a large church service in downtown Boston. And, and on Monday, he wrote in the, in the Boston Globe newspaper, he wrote this about the pastor of prayer. He said, that was the most eloquent prayer ever prayed to a congregation. <laughs> False worship is ceremonial. It's focused on ordinances. What it says in Hebrews 9.10, Hebrews 9.10, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of Reformation. So when the Samaritan woman asked which mountain is the correct place for worship, she was focused on the ceremonial activity and not on the state of her heart. And Christ said that the Father was not looking for the false worshiper who concerned himself with the ceremonial aspects of religious activities. That the Father was looking for the true worshiper who concerned himself with his inner state of his heart. That was the difference between the Pharisee and the publican in Luke 18.10. Luke 18.10, two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Publican standing afar off would not lift, but let me, let me say that again. The publican standing afar off would not so much lift up his head, eyes to heaven, would smote upon his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalts himself shall be abased. He that humbles himself shall be exalted. The Pharisee was focused on what could be seen by others. Others could see. The Pharisee was praying. Others could see. The Pharisee is fasting twice a week. Others could see. The Pharisee is giving money. The Pharisee said nothing about what other people could not see. State of his heart, sinful heart. That made the Pharisee a false worshiper. On the other hand, the publican was focused on, on what could not be seen. It says he was standing far away. He didn't want to be seen. It says he wouldn't lift up his eyes to the skies. He, 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 he looked at his hidden heart, and he said, I'm a, I, I, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That made the publican a true worshiper. This is all so new for this woman to hear this is also revolutionary for the woman to hear. It's also different from what she's been taught. But the woman is willing to set aside all she's been taught in the past as she's listening to Jesus. And the woman's willing to wipe the slate clean of all that she's been, been brought up to believe as she hears Jesus. And now she yields her mind, she yields her spirit to Jesus and she wonders something. She wonders about who is this Jesus. And she decides to go fish for an answer. And she fishes for an answer with this, with this statement. She's so impressed about how Jesus has told her so many things about herself and about worship and so forth. And she knows that the Messiah or Christ is coming and that Messiah or Christ is going to tell all things. And she wonders, could he be the Messiah? So she fishes in verse 25. In verse 25, when she says, The woman saith unto him, I know the Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Now, when Jesus heard that, he determined to not leave her hanging. He determined to not leave her wondering any longer. And so he says to her in verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. This was the clearest statement that Jesus ever made to anyone that he's the Messiah, and he made it in a private conversation with one person, a Samaritan woman, that left no doubt that he is the Messiah. And because what this woman said about the Messiah was fantastic. It resonates with us. She said in verse 25, verse 25, I know Messiah comes, we call Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. He will tell us all things is a message we hold so dear 
about Jesus Christ, which is when we immerse ourselves in his word, in the word of Christ, he tells us all things. What kind of things he tells? He tells us what we need to know, and he tells us what we don't need to know. And his statement, the statement in verse 25, he will tell us all things, is all really encompassed in 2 Timothy 3.16. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction of righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. The word doctrine means he will tell us what's true and what's not true, what's false. He already has with the worship. The word reproof means he'll tell us when we're wrong. The word correction means he'll tell us how to stop being wrong and how to get right. And the words instruction of righteousness means he'll guide us in life so that we live a life that, that's right and not wrong. That's how Christ tells us all things, through Scripture. So when Christ went to tell this woman that he was the Messiah, there was kind of a beauty in, in, the, in this whole passage. And, and first of all, he didn't just tell her that he was the Messiah. He put an emphasis on his words in verse 26. Verse 26, when he say, he, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So he's saying, it's not because of your feelings that you're gonna know that I'm the Messiah. It's not because of miracles that you're gonna know I'm the Messiah because in fact you've seen no miracles to her. It's not because others told you that I'm the Messiah, which in fact no one did tell her that he was the Messiah. Simply he said, because of my words that I'm speaking to you, you should know that I'm the Messiah. It's his words that convinces the soul that Jesus is the Messiah, which is what he said in John 6, 63. John 6, 63. It's the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profit nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit, they are life. Peter realized that that Christ had special words, special words of eternal life that convinced Peter that Jesus was the Messiah. John 6, 68, John 6, 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and are sure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And when the word of God enters into a soul, it gives light. It gives an understanding. It takes darkness away. And the understanding that, that, that he's the Messiah. This is what's meant by Psalm 119, verse 130. Psalm 119, 130. The entrance of thy word give, words giveth light. It giveth understanding unto the simple. Faith to believe that Jesus is the Messiah comes from hearing the word of God. It's the entrance of the words that give that, that. And Romans 10, 17, Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when Christ said in verse 20, 26, um, I that speak unto thee am he, he did not say I that speak am he. Those two little words unto thee are so important when, when Jesus said in verse 26, I that speak unto thee am he. So Christ told the woman that he was not just speaking, he was speaking to her. And this is what happens to us when we read the Bible. We realize that it's not just God speaking, but all of a sudden we realize he's speaking to me, he's speaking to us, he's speaking directly to our hearts, just like the him puts it, just like the hymn puts it. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow ways. He lives, he lives, he lives, salvation to a part. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. How do we know that Jesus lives and he's the Messiah? It's because he walks with us and talks with us. And what's particularly beautiful 
about this history is how the woman is gradually brought step by step out of darkness to be brought to from a place of darkness, which is verse 9. She's in darkness in verse 9 when she says, thou being a Jew. She's saying, you're nothing more than just a Jew. That's all. Into the full light of seeing Jesus in verse 25. In verse 25, as Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he's come, he'll tell us all things. She starts out in darkness as to who Christ is in verse 9. She comes in verse 25 to the light of seeing he's a Messiah. And it's these verses in between, verses 9 and 25, that are so beautiful because they show us how gently he, she was brought by Christ from one instruction to another to finally see that Christ is the Messiah. The, he's really being the shepherd of, of Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. He's, being the, he's gently leading this little lamb along. And it all happened as Christ spoke to her. It happened by speaking. He spoke to her not as an opponent, not as somebody against her, not as, you know, he brings up the matter about her husbands and that's enough. But he spoke to her as a friend. And this speaking as a friend is how Jehovah Jesus is described as speaking to Moses in Exodus 33, 11, Exodus 33, 11. The Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he was speaking to her as a friend. As a friend, Jesus led her to finally she took that step and reached out and asked Christ for the living water. In verse 15, verse 15, she saith unto him, Sir, give me this water. She had to ask. She had to ask to receive. And Jesus, by speaking to her, led her to step out and ask, which he did. And, and this is what the thief on the cross did. The thief on the cross in Luke 23, 39, Luke 23, 39, one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. The other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. This man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. It was not enough for that, that thief to just believe that Jesus was the Messiah. That thief had to reach out and ask for himself, just like that woman. In, in, in that, 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 that woman did in verse 15 when she said, Sir, give me this water. The thief in Luke 23, 42, Luke 23, 42 said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And after that, after the thief did that request, then he got the promise where Christ said to him in Luke 23, 43, Luke 23, 43, Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. How tragic to think that there were those that knew that Jesus was the Messiah and never asked, never asked to be saved. That's worse than ignorance to know, and it's worse than ignorance. What's worse than ignorance is to know and refuse, which is what Jesus said was the case in John 5.40, John 5.40. You will not come to me that you might have life. All right, so now the disciples come back. They return from the city. And they see him speaking with the woman, and they're shocked. They're amazed in verse 27, verse 27. Upon this came his disciples, marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, what seekest thou, why talkest thou with her? Christ has just led a lost woman out of darkness, out of death, to light and to life. And as he made this clearest declaration that he's the Messiah, the disciples only see that she's talking with the woman, that he's talking with the woman, they don't understand. They're just shocked. How could he condescend so low to speak to this immoral Samaritan woman? And because the disciples are still infected with the rabbinical prejudices against the spiritual abilities of a woman, 
They haven't come yet to the understanding that in Christ there's no such thing as male and female. Galatians 3.28, Galatians 3.28, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither bond nor free, there's neither male nor female, you are all one in Christ Jesus. But what we read in verse 27 is that they keep their questions to themselves and not one of them asks, why are you speaking with this Samaritan woman? But now we next read about just a little note, which is very significant, in verse 28. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot. That's a little note. And then it says, and it went into her way into the city and said to the men, come see a man which told me all things ever I did is not this the Christ. So the little note is so important because it, it, it's for us to see in verse 28, the little note, the woman left her water pot. She came to the well to get water. And what she got at the well was so much better than just water that she just left the water pot and went into the city. She left the water pot because something more important had overcome her, had happened to her at the well that caused her to forget why she even came to the well. She became so engrossed in the teaching that she had received from Christ. She became so amazed at these new revelations that she was getting about living water that getting the water is no longer important to her. And she's so excited about having found the Messiah that the whole focus of her life has changed. And that's all reflected in her leaving that water pot there. And now she's on a whole new mission in life that's gripped her. And her new mission is, i got to tell others. I must now tell others what I've found in this man named Jesus. So when she left that city, she left as a notorious sinful woman. And then she came to the well and she met Jesus. Now she returns to the city as an excited evangelist. And, and, and we're told in verse 28 that it was not to the women of the city that she went. It says in verse 28, she saith to the men. It was to the men of the city, not to the women. Now why did she make this beeline to the men of the city to tell them about Jesus. It was because she found in Jesus forgiveness and cleansing from her sin. She found in Jesus the removal of the darkness of the death that her sin had caused and the sins that she was guilty of were committed with the men of the city. The men of the city shared in her sexual sins. The men of the city were her partners in sin. And she knew, she knew who needed the most, the forgiveness and the cleansing from sin and the new living water that she had drunk from, the men of the city. And that's why she went to them. And she told the men in verse 29, verse 29, come see a man which told me all things ever I did is not this the Christ. When she said to the men that Christ had told her all things that ever she did, she's not afraid to own up to her shame. She's not embarrassed to confess these terrible sins publicly. She's not hiding her sins. She's not saying, I don't want to talk about that right now. She's not saying, I didn't do anything wrong. She, she has an infectious joy about being freed from her sins. She's got a humility that shows that, that she's, look, I've been redeemed, and she wants to be the Psalm 107 too. Psalm 107 too. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. She's doing the work of an evangelist in verse 29 when she says, come see a man which told me everything as I did is not this to Christ. As an evangelist, she's inviting the men in verse 29, come see a man which told me all things ever I did. As an evangelist, she's not saying to the men, you men are sinners and you need to come and be saved like I was. She's not doing that. If she had been doing that, she would have been forcing her faith on them. That's not what evangelist does. No one likes to be forced. As an evangelist, she's telling the men what Jesus has done for her personally, and she's inviting the men in verse 29. Come see. That's what evangelist does. He invites, come see. And what she's saying to the men is that they should come see for themselves. The evangelist 
respects the dignity of a person's choice. The evangelist does not push, does not force. He simply invites, as Christ did, when the two disciples started to follow Christ and they had a question for Christ in John 1.37, John 1.37, the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith to them, What seek ye? They said unto him, Rabbi, which is me interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? He saith unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw. This was the message of Philip to Nathaniel when Nathaniel doubted Philip. John 1.45, John 1.45, Philip find him in Nathaniel and saith then, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nathaniel said unto him, Can there any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip saith unto him, Come and see. That's the message. Come and see. It's, it, 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 it's so much more powerful when a person comes and sees than just hearing from another person. When a person comes to Christ and sees for himself who Christ is. And this is what the men of the city did in verse 30. Verse 30, then they went out of the city and came unto him. Those men of the city accepted the woman's invitation to come and see, and they came and they saw for themselves when they came to Jesus. And when those men did come out of the city and saw for themselves, they said to the woman, in verse 41, verse 41, many more believed because of his own word, and said unto the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying, for we've heard him ourselves and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. They said in verse 32, we have heard him for ourselves. And this is what convinced them. They had heard Christ for themselves. So what we really have in this last portion, this portion here, are two groups of men from the city. One group believed on Christ because they were so impressed by the woman. And that's the group of verse 39. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, he told me all that ever I did. That was the first group who heard the woman. They believed on Christ because of the testimony of the woman. The other group believed on Christ because they heard Christ for themselves and they were a larger group than the first group that believed because of what the woman said. The second group is in verse 41. Verse 41, many more believed on him because of, their, because, because, because of his own word. And they said to the woman, now we believe not because of thy saying. We heard him ourselves. We know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. These two groups exist today. The first group is ex represented today by people who go to a good church, preaching the Bible, they sit under the ministry of a pastor or a Bible teacher. They believe because of the ministry of the pastor or the Bible teacher. The second group today is, are people who have pressed through to the person of Jesus Christ. They have a vibrant, direct relationship with Christ. They believe because of what Christ personally speaks to them. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for the beauty of this, of what Christ did in bringing this woman out of darkness to light. In Jesus' name, amen.